So, right into it. We've had a pretty interesting week, and by interesting, I mean actually just awful. In terms of EDG, things have not been going so well for them, or uh, lately. And by well for them, I mean they actually lost a few games. This week, on the other hand, they, specifically, they actually had a losing record. Two games won, three games lost. So, because of course they had a three-set week. So, I want to start off with uh, Kelsey. How do you... What happened? What's going on? What happened? What happened? What happened? What happened? Ross, what happened? <laughs> what happened? So I don't think that's how it's supposed to work. <laughs> the primary theory from which I operate is mm. that uh, uh, putting Cora 1 and pa and uh, Bamey in at the same time, or Amazing J and Pawn in at the same time, is a recipe for complete and utter disaster because... <laughs> Either way, either you can't team fight in the second half, or in the first half, you have no early game pressure. And this is how EDG operated last year for a lot of the time. And they actually had really, really inconsistent early split where they dropped a lot of games. So like this is not atypical for them. Um, if we think about how many one-one splits and random losses to Young Glory they had like last last year. Um, playing with really, really low pressure early game solo laners in Korra 1 and U. Uh, this is just not shocking. It's just like Bamey for me is like a worse version of U. So, not that Bamey has been playing really poorly in general. I just think that, like, in terms of ceiling and some of the team fighting ability that U has, like, Bamey is the same style of player, but he hasn't hit quite that ceiling. Um, and so, for me, this is like something that happens in, in their early game, they'll clear level try to make an early play, and then it'll backfire, and they'll fall behind, and then they'll still manage to almost come back, but then there will be some sort of disorganization in their team fighting just because the roster isn't used to each other, and then they'll just lose, death might miss position. It's like really just a matter of the pieces not fitting together properly right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like Bamey and Koro just are really uncomfortable playing with each other because as you mentioned in the mid-game, things te seem to like go okay. I feel like their skirmishing is still pretty decent and Def can still play pretty well in those skirmishes, but like almost all of the games that EDG lost this weekend, it was like, okay, they're in this, this is fine, and then they just get absolutely obliterated in a late-game team fight, and then they just like lose after one team fight, and then it just like, happens every time that they get to late game with this setup. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think they're also, like, in switching between the two lineups, I think they do lose a bit of synergy, and I know that, like, um, Deft in particular has come under fire for, like, mispositioning and team fights, and then additionally, like, his Kalista and Tristana just honestly aren't as good as his other champions, so, like, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't feel like that's very difficult to, like, disagree with. I don't know. Maybe you guys disagree, but I, I wasn't impressed with him again this week on either of those champions. So, um, I also think that, like, and I was talking to Kelsey about this a little bit before, but I think that, or she brought up the point about Deft's mentality, and, like, Deft as a player has kind of always been someone who's been on a team that kind of, like, not necessarily revolves around him, but gives him, like, a really large window of opportunity to get back in mid and late game team fights. Um, that's what, you know, Samsung Blue relied on, um, and that's what um, EDG last split relied on, and then to some extent the split. So I think when you're kind of shifting back and forth between different um, different lines or, like, different players in the top and the mid, it's going to affect the overall performance when the team comes together. And, like, in the WE set, they lost a lot of it. Was like Spirit just like he they. I mean, EDG was gonna win that game until the, he had that like ridiculous explosive cask at like 30 minutes or something that just perfectly split EDG. So mm -hmm. then and then Aluka got like Scion and Nautilus. So it was like you know he's not gonna yeah. be throwing their team fights for them. So mm -hmm. I mean the the WE set isn't. Like, there were a lot of incremental things that they gave up in the early and mid-game, but um, at the same time, like, it, at both of those games for me came down to, like, Spirit just kind of outplaying them a bit. So how did they get in that position when it came to World Elite? Because with, with, obviously everybody knows that World 
Elite is a last place. Well, actually, technically, are they a last place? They're tied. I always have to check. They're tied for last. There's yeah. no other yeah. place tied now. Okay. So, A, sure, the pieces may not fit, but at the same time, you would expect that the players individually would be better. So, what mm. happened? Like, is, is World Elite forming together to be a better team, or is it just a holistic, is, it, is, is EDG falling apart? Or at least fell apart for that one week. World Elite uh, is I literally th the best team in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, well, I think World Elite did overperform in that set, but at the same time, I actually don't think the individual play was that bad for EDG. Like, I didn't think it was great, and obviously I'll never think Bami is that good. I don't know, I've just never been really impressed with him. But even, like, Def and Koro, I don't think they really did that bad. I think Def, like, sure, he wasn't exceptional, but I still think he was, like, average in terms of LPL carries. It's just that, you know... It's, it's like, kind of hard to gauge his performance because anytime he's not absolutely monstrous, you kind of are like, oh, that's something. But, like, sometimes he just has an average game. But with Koro, like, I don't know, I just feel like his, his synergy with that specific team, like, makeup is just not as good. I want to say it's an entire team fault because when I was watching Koro, as, uh, they, as some people mentioned that, like, Koro might be slumping, but when I was watching Koro in the, in the World Elite set, he didn't seem like he was doing anything particularly wrong like I would see him playing Hecarim fairly well like he would be zoning and going after Mystic and kind of keeping Jinx under wraps so she couldn't really get much damage off um, and Def would and it's not like he was just abandoning Def at all those times either like Def was still getting some autos in on the front line and stuff but it just yeah I think as a team like they just all didn't work well together and that I don't really think it was an individual thing mm -hmm. so uh -huh. I mean I don't I mean, I don't know. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe it's a. I don't really think it's a compositional issue, but like when I when I watched him play, I was like, okay, yeah, sure. Like the the, the problem I have with the, the the criticism on individual play for EDG is that I don't think it's safe to. I don't think it's fair to say Koro and Death played bad just because they played well but not Average. exceptional. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's just a matter of. There, for me, are, are like three big factors, and two of them I think are somewhat systemic and difficult to fix. Um, but one of them is just little mistakes, right? It's just these that are showing cohesion, because historically if you look at all of Aaron's teams, Aaron the coach, all of his teams, like the strengths of them has been in the team building. People talk about his drafting, all this other stuff, but the pieces fit together in this way to compensate for weaknesses, like the way that the players develop their styles, the way that Pawn, for example, just does stupid, ridiculous things and pulls a lot of pressure in the early to mid game. And then Koro is able to play very well from behind, like as someone who, as a top laner who receives very limited resources relative to the region average, um, he is still able to sometimes even win lane or sometimes uh, he's able to come back from behind with these like crazy ultimates and zoning so that that interesting dynamic is kind of what boosted edward gaming um and then the fact that all of that is happening so there's there's not a lot of pressure that clear love has to apply in the mid or top lane and he can focus on deft so that kind of overarching synergy i think is something that's and then mako controls the vision really well like his Mako's vision control, people don't talk about it a lot, but it's really interesting. From behind, Mako actually consistently outwards like his opponents by like double digit warding. So um it, it's it's just an interest so that's that's part of how EDG mm -hmm. can come back from behind in some instances with their team fighting, is just because they'll just have more wards on the map than the winning team. Um, mm -hmm. and they'll be able to get these picks and set up these flanks. Like, their flanking is really good. Like, the way, if you think about the way they place wards, and then Koro will teleport to the ward, and, like, a lot of times you see these extended team fights where Koro gets low, he leaves the team fight, he goes back, he, like, buys home guard, and then teleports back into the fight. Like, if you don't have wards set up in such a way around the fight, you can't execute a team, an extended team fight like that. Mm -hmm. um, so just that, the fact that all of these pieces are working together extremely well if you disrupt some of that in some way, you're going to have more little tiny mistakes. More things yeah. that other teams can find holes in and capitalize on. Maybe, so, especially in a mixed language team, if you're having issues with, like, if you bring in a new player who doesn't understand the communication system or things like that. Uh, so these things, I think, this is something that they can work on with their transitioning roster if that's something that they want to 
and pose for the long run. Like, Clearlove posted on his Weibo that he thinks that we're in the chrysalis state and we need to go through this chrysalis state to become a butterfly or some random mm -hmm. esoteric Clearlove <laughs> shit. <laughs> as much Most of the time, he just, like, wants to look like he's going to murder them. But there's yeah. two things I find that are actually systemic, and I'll make these brief so Mike can talk, sorry. Um, is that pe teams are figuring out to target clear love. Like, I think that that's a mistake that a lot of teams made against EDG last split that they aren't making anymore, is that they realize that clear love gets a lot of the team's resources. Clear love is the one, like, the team rises or falls based on whether or not clear love is making plays. Um, all these other factors. And then, so you see these supports, like, chase him around the jungle, and you see other junglers counter jungle him, or things like that more effectively now. Um, also, the, the third thing is Deft, and in, within the pick and ban phase, the fact that he doesn't play Callista and you have all these other champions to ban is an issue. Like, you have to always waste a ban on Callista. Um, and so when you face a team like WE that's so dependent on Spirit getting his champion, that can actually be a big factor. All right. Michael? Yeah, I agree. Uh, actually, despite... Um... Despite how cheesy the clear love message is with the chrysalis phase thing, I actually think think it's pretty accurate on a global scale rather than just in uh, like a domestic scale, because, like, I think that being able to win the way they are in terms of, like, okay, mid and top are just going to do so well in lane that clear love can put all of his energy into deft and then deft can carry really hard and have a strong laning phase himself. I think that that works really well domestically, but I think is actually really good for uh, future proofing against like like Korean competition, for example, because I don't feel like they're always going to be able to rely on the crutch of the fact that Koro and Pawn are just going to crush their lane. So that way they mm -hmm. can't really get too like comfortable with that play style, and they can play around that and find oh, like uh, something that works at least against other world-class teams uh, when they get to that stage and when Death's not like uh, so heavily prioritized. I think this is an interesting discussion because I feel like there are two points in which I want to want to ask you guys about and speak, to speak on um, because I guess now you're seeing teams more, like as Kelsey said uh, more have like they heavily clear, like track clear love in his jungle they stop him into being that structure for his team and so one thing I like to notice is or at least ask you guys eh, I think at least world elite is world elite the team right now that has a positive win record with EDG this split I mean actually I can't even say that since it's not taking, I was actually saying this split along with playoffs uh, as well. And I feel like, if that's true, because they they did go five games with them in playoffs, and at the same time they picked two games here. But the, I would say that's in part due to the fact that the whole, the biggest strength of the world elite comes in their jungling. It comes in spirit and his ability to actually track down the enemy jungler at times due to his aggression, or create more impact on the map due to it. And World so, Elite might be the most comfortable team in terms of understanding how like one's own jungle gets focused down. So, mm -hmm. so well, would that I be think, a fair statement? I think, I mean, I think when teams are struggling and in general in Season 5, jungle is just such, like, the, it's a really interesting point because jungle for me is a, such an important position right now in terms of dictating pretty much everything. Um, for how your team is going to go for the first, like, 15, 20 minutes. Um, I also think that WE, while I don't think that they're a particularly good team, I think that they are really good at playing around Spirit. Like, they know how... They know what, like, generally they have to do in order to win a game, and it's pretty much, like, have Spirit carry them, right? Um, mm -hmm. And another thing that made a difference in those fights is that Aluka got Scion, and then he got Nautilus, like I said. So, like, it, as Nautilus, he was just kind of standing in the middle, <laughs> in the middle of team fights and, like, just tanking damage. And it's just like, okay, you know, it's like, he doesn't have to do anything because he can yeah. just soak up all the damage for the team, and then Spirit can kind of do whatever he wants. And um, I think just studying, like, uh, studying junglers in like a, I don't know, a big weird like obsession of mine lately has been just studying people's jungle path thing. Studying junglers in Korea and studying junglers in China, I think that um, it's a lot of successful teams are going, it's going to come down to how well their jungler does 
And I think, um, I mean, you even saw it from IG in one of their games today where Kakao just, or not today, but this past week where Kakao just kind of flat out carried them on, on Jungle Echo. Um, like, if you have a really strong jungler that can path well and, you know, set up surprises for the opposing team, it just makes a huge, huge difference in how successful your team will be. And mm -hmm. it's worth noting that last split, Clear Love had the highest percentage of team gold of like any jungler in the league. Mm -hmm. um, even more so than Spirit, so they were able to funnel a lot of resources into him, he got a lot of lane kills, and actually this week his percentage of team gold raised a lot, especially from like the sets where he was taking a lot more early kills and kind of like trying to brute force carry in some instances. Whereas, but now Spirit is. Spirit is that jungler. So it's like WE finally got the pieces together and was able to distribute the gold effectively into mm -hmm. their biggest resources. So. Um, it's an interesting thing to note. Is this a see. thing that's going to be threatening, like, uh, EDG as a whole? Because we're starting to see a lot more teams with that kind of style in jungle. Like, for instance, Xiao Q. Uh, even Beast is starting to play that kind of role, even though not so much... I feel well, like everyone is kind of playing that role. I, on he needs to stop even, playing Middle East. <laughs> Kakao has stepped up particularly yeah. in terms of like where you see him moving around the map like what he like his selfish style even with yeah. rookie who typically gets mm -hmm. most of that like Kakao is definitely claiming some of his own stakes in mm -hmm. the game yeah Emily um, you did have something to say earlier before I kind of cut you down yeah, no, I was like, what was like? That's just rude. Hey, um. <laughs> oh, I don't do that <laughs> ever. The other, thing, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the other thing, sorry, I'm like sick, so my mind's everywhere. Um, the other thing I did notice in the WE EDG set, and I don't know if it's just me, like when I went back and watched the VODs again before the show, I did notice that in team fights and Clear Love is like such a like really strong team fighting. He has very jumper, nice kits. In my opinion. His he had a couple of like <laughs> really like <laughs> weird decisions in terms of like what who he went on in team fights, especially in I think the second game. Like there was one point where he jumped on a Luca and I was just like, oh like he extended a fight at Dragon and, and mm. basically like went after a Luca, even though Aluka as Nautilus obviously wasn't going to die. And it, it kind of affected the whole team fight after that. And I thought that was very odd to see from him because that's not usually something that you see from Clear Love at all. So I don't know if you guys saw that. If it was like... I saw it. I couldn't tell if it was just like a miscommunication thing or if it was just kind of a like, let's try to mow down the front line as, as hard as possible with everything we have, which obviously, you know, when, when a Nautilus has resources, you kind of don't want to do that. And the way, the way EDG does set up their team fights, if you watch, uh, Koro is always going to be the one who tries to zone out the damage threats, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas Clear Love will try to lock down the front line and position himself between Deft and the front line um, to isolate those targets to mow down first. So maybe it's just an instance of they don't know how to play around Nautilus yet. Um, something like that. In particular, that that type of style isn't working against a Nautilus composition. Doesn't work against a BUE, etc. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's what I mean with this like particular set is like it's just stylistically, even though World Elite's a much worse team, especially if EDG performs, WE has like one of the best chances of the lower teams to upset because of the fact that they're so used to dealing with this high jungle pressure, and because of the fact that Aluka is so keen on uh, playing super tanks, and well, at least that's what he's best at, and EDG uh, suffers against both just because of like how they play or intrinsically. Words are hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think the worst game for Clear Love was the, this week was the game they lost to WE Future. Oh god, yeah. Um, <laughs> Clear Love <laughs> Some plays something that people might not realize is that Clear Love plays a lot of Nidalee in solo queue. He has a bunch of different accounts on the KO Challenger ladder that have different champion emphasis, but his for, since Nidalee's release, his Chinese solo queue account, his most played has been Nidalee. Um, mm -hmm. But he hasn't ever played it in a competitive match before. So this was his first, like, he's playing it in, against WE Future, because Pawn would always play it, right, for EDG. Um, mm -hmm. 
and he's playing against WE Future. They have this skirmish that goes terribly, terribly wrong within the first 10 minutes of the game. Pentaq, WE Future's AD carry gets a triple kill. And then yeah. Clear Love persistently keeps trying to gank the bottom lane and fix it, and just feeds relentlessly like the entire time. <laughs> what is going on? I don't understand. <laughs> So here's my question is how much of this since I'm just gonna this is probably gonna be the last question until we turn on onto a worldly filled discussion. Um, how much of this is EDG kind of tanking themselves through roster swaps or just whatever issues they're having currently? And how much is this other teams, let's say Chaogu, IG, or even World Leap, let's say, since they're having a really good week. Um, how much is that Chinese team catching up? Uh, I think it might be a little bit of both, but I think it's primarily EDG's roster swaps because even though it's just one player, like Baby being there instead of Pawn is like completely different for just the chemistry of EDG because without, like, they relied so heavily on Pawn on either being the guy that's like completely ignored and then carries by himself or the guy that literally just plays as a distraction so that the other threats can get ahead. And Baimi just kind of like exists and isn't bad or isn't great, but he doesn't like he doesn't like complete the chemistry of the team, and so they have to play completely differently around him. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. sorry. I was just going to briefly say that um, I think the mid laner more than any other player will dictate the style of the team. I don't think that necessarily like Pawn is essential to the way EDG plays their game. It's just that any particular piece removed from the team or moved around is going to change the way that they have to play, especially in terms of a team that like fits together so well, you know, yeah. uh, as I already addressed. And mid lane in particular, just because it does have such a stylistic influence on the rest of the map, is going to be big. And Actually, the two styles are just so different. Yeah. Like, and pa Pawn is just like, the way he plays is basically to act as a distraction and, and be very, like, flashy and forward. And that's completely different than the way Vimy plays, which is just kind of, like, Mike said, to exist. And actually, before I move on, I had this question on here, and I guess I forgot to ask. Um, is EDG super reliant on structure? Like, for instance, every other team, let's say... Um, I, in fact, you can pretty much say every team that isn't EDG. Let's just let's just put it that way. Um, they have a bit of lacking structure when it comes to vision control. When it comes to, I guess, map movements and and how certain players act on that uh, or expect their role to be played. So, like for instance, you have Deft to relies on, I would say, the vision control and Mako to put him through. Oh, usually. I think he's actually had a decent laning phase for now. But let's say uh, by me or Pawn, kind of expecting a lot more pressure in the mid lane. Well, not so much by me lately. Um, but do you think that they really rely on the pressure, uh, early game pressure or just early game structure that they usually had for about like a couple of years now? Um, to and or is it do, uh, do you, or do you think that's just a mute thought that it's just well, kind of? Mm. I think saying a couple of years is unfair, just because when it was you on the team, it was a it was a lot less about uh, what it is currently, which is the fact that they do rely on Koro and uh, Pawn mm -hmm. to get ahead, so that they can, you know, funnel th uh, funnel Clearlove's pressure and most of the map's pressure into Pawn uh, for or into Death for late game. So it's a little bit different than it used to be, but yeah, I, w I mean, I would say it's fairly pretty important. I mean, you can see the proof they switch out one player and then look how different their performance looks. But I will say that it creates an interesting topic for discussion because, like you, like I like I was saying uh, before, there's a disparity between like doing bad and doing okay. And although I do think EDG did have a legitimately bad week, they're still at the top of the charts, which is still, which is actually really impressive when you consider it's a team that's so reliant on this five-man chemistry, that they're still doing well enough to stay on top with this experimentation. So, I mean, I obviously mm -hmm. will always uh, swear by their more efficient play style, but um, yeah, I don't, I think like uh, was mentioned earlier with the whole Chrysalis thing, that this is something that is good for them, because it'll, in the, in the long run, even if it tanks their stats a little bit, and they're not ridiculously far uh, ahead of the domestic competition, it's still really good for investment into uh, like just deeper strategy pool for uh, like com like international competition. And I just okay. 
Sorry, and before we move on, I just want to emphasize one last thing about comparing this Edward Gaming to last year's Edward Gaming. Mm -hmm. Edward Gaming, during like people, you look at their tournament records and the fact that they won like every single tournament last split except last year, except for two, and they were in the finals of those. Um, just it speaks to the and you look at their regular season LPL performances where they were just like dropping games left and right to Young Glory. Um, the first split they didn't even win, come in first in the regular season. The second split they just barely in the last week inched ahead of OMG and Starhorn. So the but then they just always won. So this idea that they were a dom a completely dominant team is is somewhat mm -hmm. obfuscated by the by their tournament results. And mm -hmm. I think that as long as they're still winning, they're still EDG, they're still ahead. So mm -hmm. Okay. All right, moving on to the next topic, which is not so far off. Uh, World Elite. They didn't drop a single game this week. Went on to, they beat EDG, beat M3, who is on the rise, or at least that's what it, that's what's being read here. That's and the that's the word on the <laughs> well, street. Master three. Uh, to clarify, they beat Master three in Demacia Cup, not LPL. Oh yes. Yeah, they. Yeah. they and let's just just to double check to see. Actually, they only had a one game week, so they're literally one game was EDG in the LPL, mm -hmm. or one set. And so, what can we take from this? Is this team improving, uh, or just things going wrong? I'm going to start with Michael. Uh, well, I do think they are slightly improving, but I also think that the results are skewed based on poor drafting from many of the teams faced. Like, mm -hmm. the fact that Spirit was able to get away with a lot of junglers he's comfortable on, and that Aluka could even get Scion was, like, really uncomfortable to me. But I also do think that it was a pretty overperforming week for Mystic, too, which I think was a, a big reason why WE did so well this week. Mm -hmm. I also think that... Oh, Emily, just kidding. No, I was just going to say, like, I think piggybacking on that point, I feel like a lot of... in. Draft is really weird right now because there are a lot of, like, um, power picks that I feel that teams think that they need to ban out. But the thing with World Elite is that because, like, and this is going to sound kind of bad, but, like, there's one, in my opinion, there's one person on that team that I want to target, and it's Spirit. So I feel like you can, to some extent, forget about some of those power picks, but with so many available, I feel like sometimes... Like, when those are introduced, especially with, in the form of new champions, like Echo, mm -hmm. I feel like teams think that they either need to ban them out or, you know, like, pick them away from them, when in reality, like, with World Elite specifically, I, I wouldn't even focus on that. Like, I would just still focus on banning out Spirit because he's obviously their best player. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, I think that is kind of skewing it a bit as well in terms of the way other teams have approached World Elite is, is a bit off to me. Um, and if they go back to targeting Spirit, I think you'll probably see, like, expected results once again. Yeah, and my kind of, like, tinfoil hat theory is that, uh, that I mentioned before we went live, is that the fact that these players think there's no threat at all for World Elite to actually get into playoffs or do well, which is, like, this is entirely... This is entirely anecdotal. There's absolutely no evidence to this whatsoever, but it feels like a lot of teams might be just trying to get practice against World Elite with more idolized uh, co like compositions and stuff just because, yeah, they're not really threatening their place in the standings since they're still last. Mm -hmm. but, Kelsey? And just to clarify on the drafting issue, it's not like... Oh, okay. Well, we kind of screwed up here, and we just and Spirit has changed his mind, and he's playing Gragas this game, and Rexai this game, and Italy another game. He literally played Gragas in all five of the games that they played. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's just like after the first game where he's playing Gragas, or, and he's having such a big impact on like game-winning ultimates in the last. It's yeah. like, okay, maybe we ban Gragas this game. Nope, nope. It's cool. M3 watches <laughs> watches the set against CDG. Maybe we should ban Gragas, guys. Nah, it's <laughs> totally cool. We got this. So they, uh, I like so those it's, team comps. it's almost like <laughs> I just I don't. And they're not. It's not like they're banning. They're saying, oh, okay, well, Spirit just has so many high impact champions. We're gonna ban like Nidalee, Rek'Sai, and Echo, and we're just gonna we're just gonna let him we, like Gragas. We think we can deal with the Gragas. It's like literally the no. They 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 just ban Echo. It's like the only champion they've banned against him. And since he's played it once, it's like okay, 
this is a spirit champion technically and he lost that game also to rng so it's not even like th it's a high impact pick pick for him like the gragas or the middle or the rexi um so I, I, it just it seems like it has to be intentional like they have to know that they're doing this there's no way they can miss this if he's played it like, by the time you're at the fifth game and you're in draft phase and you're thinking back to WE playing against EDG, you're thinking back to the last two games that you just lost, <laughs> nah, let's not bang Gragas. <laughs> like, it has to be intentional. Is there too much to ban for World Elite? Because I feel like the old bans that still continue to come through are Nidalee, Scion. Is that even, is that an outdated ban? Like, I feel like those bans are a bit outdated in the sense that, sure, Nidalee is actually seen still quite a bit. Um, Scion, I feel, might be a bit of a outdated one. And I guess now we're seeing Napolis from him. So is the answer purely in pick bans for this team? Uh, again, I, I, I don't think it's entirely pick ban, but I do think that that is also matchup specific. Like, for instance, mm -hmm. I think EDG is justified in banning away Scion, whereas other teams that have trouble with, you know, jungle control might think Nidalee's a better ban. But, mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, sure, you can't ban everything. You can't ban all the power picks, but you can at least ban Gragas. Like, this is one ban yeah. against yeah. something that's statistically mm -hmm. proven to be working very well in Spirit's hands. There's just no reason at all to let him get away with it. Mm -hmm. Logically speaking, so okay. you've been and the thing with Nidalee is that he can literally win the V three on the champion. Like I don't even think it matters if you let Aluka play Cyan or if you let Aluka play Nautilus that much. We still have to gauge the Nautilus because I think Nautilus is actually really overpowered right now. Um, Nautilus top, so that's something to consider. But I don't think those matter as much as because the what makes Aluka effective on those champions is that he can set up for Spirit. So Spirit mm. doesn't have his power picks. That's the more important thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I agree with that. All right then. We can only what games? Actually, let's see. What games are scheduled for next week? Just to see if they continue they, to get tested. They face one. King, so that's oh, going to well. be an important game for to see which team <laughs> can handle. But King's bands, I think, have been somewhat intelligent in that. Against OMG, they were really the first team to ban out the Maokai Sivir composition that OMG likes to use, things like that. So it might be an interesting matchup. I still think, I mean, we're talking about Hue. So, if Clear Love is having trouble against Spirit, mm -hmm. uh, you know, teams that... Like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I feel like King has a very obvious trajectory towards beating them as well, just like gank the bottom line, guys. Mm -hmm. Let's go. I have no idea what Insect is doing. We can talk about this later. I just talk about it now. Let's move on to King. <laughs> so, King. The f I mean, I said it when we came into this episode about EDG. What the fuck is happening? <laughs> what is going on with this team? Kelsey? Oh. Just to continue your thought, probably. Well, Actually, Michael, just kidding, but... <laughs> screw uh, Kelsey. I'll let Kelsey go first. Okay, Kelsey? They... split with OMG. Mm -hmm. Um... They got O2'd by IG. Mm -hmm. And they've been splitting against... T they 2 would UP, so they actually had a positive week overall. Yeah. Um... And their wins against unlimited potential were actually very convincing. Do you say? Do you think that they're on the? But their loss to Invictus Gaming was the first perfect game, I think we've had all year, and that King <laughs> didn't get a single dragon, a single tower, or a single kill. Yep. Um, I also think it was really smart for uh, IG to take uh, Echo away from Corn and use it in the jungle for that match as well. Yeah, and and that was. IG's drafting that set. Like, we were talking about how IG's drafting has been kind of AWOL because Malfa hasn't been playing. It's just kind of like, okay, for King, we're just going to show up and screw them over completely. Because the first set, they had this really smart draft where they first picked Echo. And because Rookie has had great Echo performances, they had no reason to believe that wasn't a mid lane pick. It ends up in the jungle uh, after yeah. they pick Yasuo as a counter. The game is still extremely close, but... That Aurelia, I think, is actually really smart against King, even though Aurelia isn't like a big meta pick, because 
Name, the way he positions is like very positional threat oriented, so he'll stand on the line, right? Effectively, like, he's really good at finding the line, and this is what made him really, really strong in the past, is he's very good at finding that line where he can stand on immobile AD carries and continue to, to have damage output. But Aurelia can just like dive that line extremely well. So, there are actually instances where King will win a f will, during that series where King won a fight, but then Zatai, in his last breath, dove Name and killed him, so they couldn't push towers, right? So, um, oh, it worked really well in keeping IG alive in that first game. Mm -hmm. And they managed to win in like a last-ditch last fight on the third Baron, because King actually snuck like two Barons that game. And then the so, last game, yeah. just their draft was completely demolishing, where they, like, Korn has always been a weakness on, on, in terms of his champion pool, that is very easy to exploit, because he has played a lot of champions in his career, but during any single time, he's only really competitive on, like, a select handful. So yeah. it's really easy to ban him out, typically, and he defaulted to that LeBlanc, and couldn't get ahead, because they kept him down, so it just went really, really bad for them. So would you say that, hmm, would you say that Name, Name's uh, would, uh, how do I put this, that he has impeccable auto-spacing? Anyways, <laughs> going on to the next. <laughs> I prefer the terminology positional threat, but okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I, that's a term I invented anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've never heard that before. Never. Good job. It <laughs> makes <laughs> more sense to it me. It makes sense, though. It makes a lot more sense to not have space. So, actually, it's not on the list here, but I think that now that we spoke about King, it's we might as well talk about RNG. RNG right now is actually, in my opinion, farming surprisingly well. Surprisingly well. They had and on one top set. of that. Yeah, but still. Yeah, they had well, they had one set and a Demacia Cup performance where they got three one because and the one game where they won, like Kid yeah. was like randomly fed for no reason, so I don't even count that. So they still had pretty so competitive are, games against. They're doing guess, really well, guys. Come on. I, I'm talking about the RNG standard. For the longest time, I felt like they're, they were a really shitty they're beating, team. They're beating Magus top Flandra. Think, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah good, uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't stuff. think that's a good set to gauge them on. And they and like Snake was running this weird like five threat composition that had like no front line or And anything. what did they? And what did they beat them? What did they win against last week? We okay, good. That's just. All right. Uh, All right. I was. I was actually. Raz just got blasted. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna go in on this. I'm gonna go in on this. Thing, <laughs> about RNG, I was talking to someone else about this. Uh, I was talking to Stoll about this, and he is a huge RNG fan. Um, so if he's watching this, um, and I think that I don't with understand RNG, RNG fans. They can. They can take that up with him. Um, but I think the thing with RNG is that they do have a lot of like raw talent. And they, like, I think they can take a game off of most teams, to be honest. Like, I think they can surprise teams. I think they can take a game. But I still don't see them having any sort of, like, a, I think it's almost like a weird, like, where they're setting up their fans for kind of, like, false hope. Because I still don't see a lot of cohesion or, like, as much of an understanding of um, what they need to do on the map at certain times, like what objectives they need to take, how they need to move as a team. I, do, I just don't see them, like, I do think they have a lot of talent. I just don't see them being able to win, like, a best of set. Like, I think they can take games off people, but I don't, I think it's almost, like, kind of weird to say that they're good, because I still don't think they're a good team. As you know me. what's weird about RNG? <laughs> so they're the king. They're literally king with a more proactive mid laner. Not even a more skilled mid laner, but a more proactive mid laner. Yeah, and again, I mean, even though we say that mid affects, like, you know, the team's play style so much, they still have the same exact issues they had when they were king, I feel. Mm -hmm. so. And, yeah, the teams are getting better, so that obviously puts them in a worse spot. Just a second. You guys govern yourselves. i got to quickly attend to some things. Uh, interesting. Okay, so. My host. Wow. What do we feel about uh, the vision control? <laughs> yeah. uh, no, but uh, in terms of like King, um, since we kind of like glossed over that really quick, 
I don't know. Like, it's it's really, it's really kind of hard to gauge King's performance, too. Like, I think they went positive, but I also... Like, especially in the set against OMG, I feel like... I don't know. Korn, Korn's, like, Echo is super overperforming, and I also think that... Like, it, was, it wasn't it was that hard of a set for them just because they were able to ban away or take away Maokai and Sivir from OMG, which made the set, like, significantly harder for OMG, obviously, because those are two mm -hmm. champions that always make OMG do well, so... I think I that know. speaks well of them, though. Like, I actually like... it's It stinks, because, like, first of all, they had the horrible, like, first two weeks without... Yeah. Zero and and insect and then like insect this. like it's... who knows what he's doing up in top lane like I'm used to it but you guys aren't. So. No, I yeah, um, it's actually. Like, it's... I think I think they come in with like some pretty good strategies. I just think two things: one, teams for whatever reason, to Kelsey's point, tend to like come in and they're like, oh, we're gonna play our best against <laughs> against King, and then. Secondly, I I think that they I don't know they they're so far behind. It's going to be really difficult for them to win enough games to actually make it into playoffs at this point, oh, yeah. just because of that start. They're just so while I'd like to see them do well, like while I'm honestly like really rooting for them, I don't have a lot of high hopes, they're unfortunately. Just... So, like, given how competitive I feel the split is, because we do see teams like WA and UP taking games off EDG, we do see teams like um, OMG and RNG splitting series, like Chaogu dropping a game to King here and there, it's just, mm. the more 1-1 one -one splits we see, the, the more entrenched standings become, you know, because yeah. teams just stay yeah. where they are, and so those two O's, start to matter a lot more and King only has one two oh so far. And they're just not gonna they're not gonna like it's sure we could say, oh it's impressive that they came out with a strategy that allowed them to take this game off of LGD because I actually think their rotational play in that game was really smart. Or that, oh, they were the first team to see through OMG's weaknesses, so that's really cool for them. Mm -hmm. And oh I just like Korn's echo is he's I'm just, looks like he actually understands the champion, which is surprising for him. <laughs> but just these these little things don't make them a playoffs worthy team necessarily you know what I mean unless they can get those two O's and there has been one team so we're already I'm trying to wrestle control back after my absence <laughs> that might might be a playoff worthy team there's a little bit of discussion M3 Masters 3 what do you guys feel about them how's their week been uh, they had a really good week, but at the same time, my thoughts for M3 is like, okay, if they can't get significantly ahead in the early game, then they can't do anything. But mm -hmm. if they're able to consistently get ahead in the early game, then they have a chance. But I feel like that, I mean, I think that that gives them playoff potential, but I don't know about so much beyond that. Because mm -hmm. they still have trouble when they're not, when they don't have like a massive gold advantage, okay. I feel. So. The thing with... The Master 3 is that in the past they've just been so inconsistent. Like, we've seen them come out with smart strategies and things during a week. They were the first team to 2 a snake last split. Things like that. They've sometimes Dade decides he wants to play a game, sometimes Looper decides he wants to play some League of Legends. <laughs> the only actual consistent player on that team seems to be Condi, and he's a consistent in so far as he can have a strong game impact if he's playing Rek'Sai. And otherwise, he looks really lost, to be honest. Mm -hmm. or, he, or Lee Sin. I, I'll give yeah, him Lee Sin. Um, yeah. But the, so the, the question is... Okay, so it's not, with, it's, it's not surprising that they had a good week to me. It, they've had good weeks in the past. Um, and in this, at the same token, it's not surprising to me that they got 0-3'd by WE in Demacia Cup. Mm, yeah. Dade actually had a game where he did look like he was trying, which is surprising for me in the context of third-party tournaments. And they just... it didn't work. And sometimes mm. that'll work for M3 and sometimes it doesn't. And I don't... I, 
I'm not going to say Master 3 is a good team until we see, like, them have a week where they... And, and I feel like every single game, it was like, Dada had a good game, Dada had a bad game. Every single set, I mean, Dada had a good game, Dada had a bad game, Dada had a good game, Dada had a bad game. So until I see a set or a week where it's like, Dada had a good game, Dada had a good game, Dada had a good game, Dada had a good game. Yeah. If he's going to be a primary carry threat on that team, they're not going to go anywhere unless he's having good games. I think no, another... No. He another stops thing. Counterpicking himself. Anyways, yeah, well, he's like... never gonna stop doing that. He does that in Korea too. <laughs> yeah, he does. Um, <laughs> it's just a dotty thing. Get, you have to just kind of sit. Um, another thing that I do want to bring up though with their schedule this week is that they did face IG and like um, IG when they were going through like, and it was actually honestly like a really awful set to watch in my opinion. But um, the IG was going through their weird growing pain, like, whatever's going on with that team, if they have, if they are having internal issues, um, etc. Like, that was Master 3's first set, and even then, like, they played so hesitantly, like, that the games were super long, and, like, it, they I just... just kept throwing in dives at the base. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was, it was not okay. Um, so it's I think, like... Okay. <laughs> I am not it's okay like, anymore, guys! I lost these games! It's not okay. That. That's it actually why okay. she's sick. Like, I felt, yeah, th that's what it was. Like, like those <laughs> those IGM3 games just tilted me so hard that I fell ill for the rest of the week. Um, okay. so I, think, I think when you're evaluating their performance from this past week, like, you really have to look beyond the record and look at that set specifically. And then ask yourself, like, is this a good team? Because I, I don't think the answer will be yes if you watch those sets against, uh, if you watch that set against IG. Yeah, and like, I will say that I think that <laughs> I'd like to see Love CD on um, Alistair more, like roaming, because mm -hmm. I think that they did really well with that. And I think that was part of why they did well in the early game. So that's one thing I can give kudos for. I do think okay. uh, Love CD's game impact was their strongest asset last fight, and part of that was that he actually worked well with Candy, but according to reports, he didn't like Candy, so that's why Candy isn't <laughs> playing anymore. And we have SMLZ! Thank God for He's SMLZ. like, I love you, so I'm gonna leave you alone. <laughs> Bye! <laughs> SMLZ, the biggest disappointment in terms of hype in Chinese League of Legends history. So... Or possibly of any League of Legends history, given the hype, yeah. He was literally known as Wei Xiao's disciple. Yeah, yeah it's like a fake... It's like Crossgren... a faker had a student, and he's like, alright, go forth, my son. And then it just ends up <laughs> and then he being just, like... Yeah, yeah and I Frost, don't know. As, as Frostgren likes to remind us every night on the broadcast, and we're just so sad about it, it's like, no. Please, no more stop reminding me. No. <laughs> and then this is what he, he looks like. It's almost like I feel people think it's gotten to the point where people are going to start to think that Wei Xiao was never that good because if this is his disciple, <laughs> <laughs> this is what he brought to the scene. Then oh, oh my god. It's, it's actually <laughs> just becoming a meme at this point. <laughs> it's actually just the <laughs> disciple. It's like, no, I don't, I don't want him to... Please no. I don't want Wei Xiao's name to be mentioned near SMLC. <laughs> uh... Sad days. So, talking about redemption stories, because I know that we're we spoke about Invictus Gaming. Hopefully, we're gonna. We're hopefully, I don't. Should we talk about IG? I think we already did last week, right? About their troubles, about their woes, about their. Yeah. Suckings, and I Apparently, feel like it's also just really hard to talk about them Zatai because of the random to, nature of it. Zatai is going to have invite all of his fans to his house in Beijing with his family if uh, they win Demacia Cup because Demacia Cup's finals are in Beijing. So he's like, Yeah, uh, oh, party at my place. By the way, I guys, think... Zatai is like a, I forgot Zatai he's a millionaire. Zatai is a child of privilege. Yeah, that is hilarious. That's no, putting it lightly. Party at Satya's house. <laughs> house. I had to think of that one a little bit because I was like, he's bringing them to his house, but that sounds a little. Wait a minute. Like, <laughs> <laughs> extremely rich. His house is actually Beijing. Yeah, <laughs> the entire city. And apparently, he has a steady. Um, print it in sticky notes on his computer screen 100 times. Like the word study in Chinese, because apparently he needs 100 reminders not to be himself. 
<laughs> oh, <my. laughs> Good. Oh, but speaking about in redemption, that IG is currently on the road to. We have OMG and Lovelings Return. So, lo OMG, huh? Yeah, OMG, guys. Yeah, yay! Woo! OMG! Yeah. Woo! Woo! Damn. Well, man, I really wish we got a, a you know, an eyeglass or at least some. An eyeglass. A monocle. A, a monocle. <laughs> an eyeglass. <laughs> oh, I, I hope that we got to look like, damn, I, I really want to look into the mind of OMG through an interview. Damn, where would we find something? No, anyways, so, I OMG. I the episode already, okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, we'll come back to that one later on, but how's, how did OMG do? How are they doing? They brought, they brought Loveling, Loveling back. Is he his old self? Or... Is he? No, I'm not gonna go. Uh, no, 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 that's a little dark. So, how was how was Loveling do? How was Loveling do? Uh, he felt he felt really sloppy in my opinion. Like not yeah. even just in terms of the team being comfortable with him, but just individually. Like he wouldn't really calculate when it was proper to appeal or engage. And like there was times where he made really simple mistakes, like just move speed type errors. Like um, I remember when he was trying to chase down Deft to zone him out. He literally just like chased him as Deft kited him to death. And, like, there's absolutely no way he could have reached him, given his cooldowns and his move speed versus Def's, and he still, like, went after it and just literally did nothing and just died in that team fight, and I think Def kind of snowballed off of that a little bit, and I don't know, it was just, I don't know, I, I mean, Loveling has had these games in regular season games before, so I'm not, like, overly concerned, and I do hope they kind of, like, keep him on board, but he definitely looked uncomfortable for his first game back. Here's the real question. Is his uncomfortable game as good or better than Joy Joy's good games? Or is Joy Joy like a really, like, what's, how do you weight their skill or what it they've kinda, shown? It's honestly really, for me, it's like really hard to actually dissect that because OMG with Loveling and with Joy Joy seem to have the same issues. Like they, especially when they were diving, like, holy cow, they were so overzealous with dives and they almost always went poorly for them. Like, it's... Like, okay, it was either they would dive, and then they would trade a kill because they were irresponsible with tower damage, or they would dive and, like, for instance, uh, which set was it? I don't think it was against Bami. It was against, yeah, it was against, it was against uh, LGD, where they would, they were tunneling on uh, diving top, and Cool was having, was, like, struggling really hard against Wayless, and Wayless was just, like, crushing him while they diverted all their resources top, and didn't even get much out of it, and still fell behind in turrets, so. Jeez. I don't know. So... Um, for those of you who don't know, here we go. Loveling is my favorite player in all of League of Legends history. So <laughs> we already here know comes. that this is gonna yep. be this is gonna be bad. Okay, but I'm going to to set aside this information as much as it pains mm -hmm. me. I'm just gonna say I'm really sad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But problem with OMG is just going to be how telegraphed the jungle pathing is right now. And it's mm -hmm. been this problem with Joy Joy, it's been the problem with Loveling, and you can say it's the jungler's fault, but the fact that they'll always be in UZI's lane at like four minutes into the game is something that I think other junglers know. So despite the fact that OMG tends to dive and go for these early ganks, uh, it gets turned on them a lot, and we saw that especially in the first game where like Clear Love was there at the moment they tried to make a dive attempt, and it went wrong. Um, mm. Clear Love then got like a second kill. Clear Love then went mid, where Cool was like, I think when we saw Joy Joy have such a successful game, remember when he was playing Lee Sin and he had that set where he went like five zero one in the first like ten minutes or whatever, mm -hmm. um, he was ganking mid. I think a big part of that is just that people were just shocked that he ganked mid. The team yeah. they were facing was just like, why is how's like if you watch their early ganks, they're almost always in UZI's lane. And another thing about Loveling is that that hasn't been his career for most of it. He'll sometimes say San and be see San and say, Hey buddy, how you doing? I still love you. Here's a hug. 
And then, like, it was, like, more of a surprise that he was ganking bottom lane than, any, than anything, but mm. approaching a lane with, like, two players in it is very different from approaching a solo lane, which Lovelace's career is much more about ganking solo lanes. Yeah. So, meanwhile, Clear Love has always played with the best 80 carries in the world, and he's like, hey, I know how to gank bottom lane. It's in my blood. I was born in <laughs> this. <laughs> you are not. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Loveling did not have a good good first step back. I will say this, but I think that OMG's problem is much more systemic. And when people look at a jungler performing poorly, whether it be Joy Joy or Loveling, it's going to have a lot to do with just the team dynamic in general and what the jungler is asked to do. Um, so I'm not gonna say, I don't think Loveling did better than Joy Joy, but I don't think he did worse either. And I think it was just like mm. a very similar poor system that they had. Okay. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. I think my, like, kind of a combination of both of your points, so that I'll just try to make this brief so I'm not repeating what you said. I just want to say he had 100% kill participation. <laughs> like, I uh, think that... I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, it was For bad. Loveling, like, like, looking at Loveling the player and considering his history, he did not play well. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, like, his overall game impact on OMG and what they wanted to do, I thought it was pretty equal to what Shui Shui has done this season, and additionally better than what they did in playoffs last split. To clarify, yeah. it's just sad to say that, you know? Because Loveling does have this history of having yeah, been I mean, the best Chinese like... jungler, and Joy Joy, when you saw him on OMD, which had a very different team dynamic and was d driven by, like, he was not a good jungler! Joy Joy was not a good jungler on that team either, and he's not a good jungler on this team, so it's not just like... And the fact to say that Loveling is performing like Joy Joy is actually just like a big slap in the face. But no, 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 I agree with you. It's just like that's, that's the reality of the situation. So. Well, and I think it, mm. it has a lot to do with, like, how OMG is playing. Like, the, the problem they had last split is that they didn't have an identity and they didn't really know how to play with UZI, and so they then morphed into this team that was built entirely around, like, UZI, and now, you know, Shui Shui can do... Like, it's come down to what I saw this week is Loveling can do... play that role about as well as Shui Shui can. Mm. And Which so, is, really, is sad yeah. in context. I mean, it looks it looks interchangeable, but I also would like to point out that this is like Loveling's first game, and Joy Joy's been playing mm -hmm. like all of the other regular season games. Yeah. So even though like a lot of the performance that OMG is having is dictated by the team in general rather than the jungle performance, I do think that it's more beneficial to keep Loveling in. But I'm someone that always said that the way that OMG is playing right now, I don't feel like it would be penalizing to bring back Loveling or, you know, obviously good going if he was in shape, but... And both Go Going and Loveling may have made recent statements on their way, but where they feel like they underperform. They effectively said they feel like they underperformed last split and they want to come back and help lead the team um, to the future. And when I did that interview with OMG recently, they... their statement effectively implied that they want to work with the roster that works the best and is the most team oriented and they're willing to try a bunch of different things and the reason why they didn't start the older players like go going and leveling isn't because they're just benched forever it's just because they need quote unquote needed more time to work on themselves and i think cloud is also included in this as well so hmm. um to work on themselves and specifically their emotional issues yeah to the idea yeah. of ganking bottom lane and that's mm. and that's it's something that isn't discussed a lot, but at the same time is extremely important to have. I guess it's extremely important to have that discussion because you'll have a lot of teams that focus their pressure in the mid lane or in the top lane. But bot lane ganks have a bit of a issue in constructing. Like for instance, right off the bat you can say, well, um, it depends who the two champions are that you're ganking. The support. Is it a Thresh? Like, okay, do you have to go after the Thresh? Is it Callista? Is it pre six Callista? Like having that like that concept. Is it even possible to gank that lane? First of all, how far are they pushed up? So you have to talk about like the pr the position of the lane and which and how you can gank. Do you have to dive? And the worst part of all of it is TP timing and mid lane uh, wave pressure. 
And who do you need to have all that shit down first before you gank bottom lane? EDG. You need to know if the mid laner can't roam. You need to know if the top laner can't TP. You need to you need to understand all of this shit. And so that's why some teams will just shy away completely from ganking bottom lane. And that's why I think the answer to ganking bot that OMG has decided to really move on. I don't want to say it's the wrong decision, but it's a really fucking hard decision. <laughs> so they need to. I feel like if that's the if that's the move that they want to go for. And here's the worst part of all of this is that even though even though they won their game, or at least they were the most impressive when it came to ganking mid lane this time, it was mostly on the idea that it was unexpected. The moment that you have your bot lane gank expected, literally that is the worst. That is actually bad. And making your jungle like your gank predictable on the worst lane to make it predictable in the sense that it can turn it they can turn it back on you in like a dime and have like five people in that lane. That's my little tangent on that. I don't like the concept of it. Until you're a team that has the coordination to be able to like expect and pressure that five man bot lane team fight that's pretty much might just happen like like LGD did in the in finals against DDG like last play uh, in the playoffs on TLDR if you are paired with Raz in solo queue do not play bottom lane yeah <laughs> I will not gank you will never gank your lane I will not gank for you it's not going to happen uh, no I mean it's hmm. it's interesting and I do think that that it wasn't that Loveling was such an exceptional jungler in terms of like his angle of approach or where he was in the lane or all this other stuff. It's just because he literally had the freedom to dictate which lane he wanted to gank, like where he was mm. going to go. And so his ganks were more unexpected within the context of the Chinese meta than a lot of junglers who did just like go bottom oh. lane all the time. Mm -hmm. So yeah. without that element of surprise, who is Loveling? And he's not dueling and invading or anything like that. He's building Devourer! I think Dre ramped up in his effectiveness also with more time with the team. So that's an interesting thought as well. Mm -hmm. Alright. So, with all that said, we should probably... Hmm. Do you guys have any other points? Should we talk about LSPL? I feel like the next week is actually kind of sad. We were going because to discuss how... top laners, but yeah, we can talk about LSPL too. Let's talk about top laners then, because yeah. I don't want to talk about LSPL, because I feel like we should talk about that next time, because next time will be a pretty bad LPL week in terms of quality of games, or at least that's what it seems like. So let's talk about top laners. Yay! 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 Yeah. So top laners in the LPL have been kind of uh, on and off, Usually, mostly off top laners right now. You know, I remember going into the the spring split saying, "Well, this is the the highest quality top lane talent that we have seen in quite some time." Well, some were along that line. Sorry to go downhill. So, let's start off with you. What do you? How would you rate the current top lane talent in China? Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of talent, like in terms of like. What they're doing, I think, like, Flandra is probably the one that annoys me the most. Because, like, Insect, Insect is whatever. Beachy is kind of, like, I'm used to Insect toppling, like, my my first and, like, one true uh, League of Legends love is KT Bullets. So, obviously, um, I've seen a lot of Insect. And he's playing pretty much exactly the insect. same. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the insect. way she said that. I don't I've, know if that's a good I've, thing or a bad I've thing. I've seen but... a lot of insect. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ashamed to admit that I've watched quite a bit of insect. <laughs> <laughs> but, this yeah. is not a valuable use of my time. So yeah. I've done it and I will own it. Um, but, you know, you kind of get used to it because he pretty much plays the same. Um, and then. Like, you you obviously had, like, I thought um, Flame and Acorn had a really good week. I mean, LG, LGD looked really good. But in terms of top laner that annoys me the most, because, again, Zatai is kind of like Insect, where he's just going to do his own thing, and you kind of just have to get used to it. Um, and I kind of love him for that, so I don't know if it's just, like, Stockholm Syndrome for being so used to Insect. <laughs> it's like, oh, like, carries over. this I'm is like, like Chinese Insect. I what is this? Yeah, like, <laughs> Oh, um, but Flandra is just baffling to me in terms of like, and and 
I I honestly kind of love Snake for like trying out random sh like crazy stuff, but I also like kind of hate them for it because it's like you get stuff like Fonder this week building like Magus uh, Magus Echo, and it, it's just not okay. <laughs> it's not. Ugh. It was just bad, and then like when he fell behind, he couldn't keep up, and I don't know. Flandre confuses me. And this is from someone who loves insects. So, <laughs> like, you, like, use that to frame to frame that context. <laughs> when you talk about gold distribution um, and team dynamic, and you're talking about, like, which top laners tilt you the most, it's gotta be the ones that the teams expect them to carry, right? And then they're building Magus enchantment and feeding! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because... Yeah. The way that these team dynamics are set up is that um, in King, uh, Insect receives below average gold distribution. Most of it goes to actually, like, the above average gold distributions are actually mid lane and support, with Name just slightly above average, so that's like kind of how they're distributing their resources. Um, with Invictus Gaming, Zatai does receive above average gold distribution, but it's mostly going to be mid jungle. Um, in terms of where they put most of their resources. If you look at Snake's gold distribution, it's like, okay, we've got some for Crystal down here, and all of this stuff is going to Flandra. Like, this is where we're, we're just gonna put it on Flandra, and he's literally building, he's literally just wasting gold building Magus and Chamay at Triforce yeah. builds. Um, and... Magus and Chamay. Triforce. Yeah, I can't. It, it I don't so understand bad. it. Like, it's... Dude, that's so much AP. <laughs> so much Come AP. On. Come on. <laughs> obviously. Uh, he obviously assumes he's like out of it because I feel like having read conversations about Plundra is he's only like half paying attention to stuff that's going on. Because yeah. looking at a conversation between him and Rookie, he thinks that their opponent in Demacia Cup this week is King. When it's actually Starhorn Royal Club, so that's like close, right? Yeah. But they're it they're not. Works on a technical it's, level. Yeah, it's not exactly the same. So he's like talking about how I'm going to be insect one v one and all this oh other shit. Oh my god! Stop. <laughs> <laughs> but so he so at the same time you kind of got he reads the patch notes about Runeglaive and he's looking at the items and he's like assuming it's Runeglaive. Then he's just building it on Fizz. He's just like this makes sense. We got this. this. Works. We got this. this hey, beautiful. this works on Echo. <laughs> so, <laughs> and he's just not even, he's only like half there. Um, so maybe he's just a space cadet. He was in Maokai prison for so long that they've given him freedom <laughs> to be a carry threat again, and he's just like enjoying it. He's playing a zero top in solo queue, he's just mm -hmm. living it up. E. Yeah. Mm. Look forward so. to that zero top. I, I really <laughs> hope it does not come out. Like, if it does, yeah. I'm just gonna be so sad. Because also, like, you is one of the better Azir players in LPL as well, so... Yeah. If you're going to draft Azir... <laughs> I mean, please. Yeah, and I feel the like that's the thing God. about Snake that I just don't understand, but I always love in the sense that, like, they were a team that literally got contained in Spring Split. Like, um... LSPL, they had a style, they just were, they, they did their own shit regardless of whether or not it was good. And you know what, he played AP Fizz top and then he loved that. So he just kept going on, he played AP Fizz top, he played Yasuo top, was horrible on Yasuo top, but he continued to play it regardless. <laughs> he, <laughs> it was like, fun. It was well, fun. The video games are for, right? That's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then, and then Spring Split, yeah, they got... They, the team, just got contained. He was like, I, I'm playing Maokai again? Okay, fine. <laughs> I have to build Zeke's arrow? Alright. It's like, so now he's just bringing it all out there. This is his, this is his, um, midlife crisis, per, per se. And he's, he's just going all out. At, like, 17 years old. <laughs> At 17 years old. That's his esports midlife crisis. His Chinese esports. He started at the age, the young age of ten. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Sixteen. They say he's seventeen now, but last year I was informed that he was fourteen. So it's like we missed its time warp somewhere in there. Like I'm not sure. Seems to happen a lot. I don't know how. <laughs> but, I mean, it was but he's also the team's shot cool. caller. So that's the other thing about Flandre is that he is the team's shot caller. So it's like. I what swear is, they all have the last name to fly. 
They all have the last name McFly. You, you just, one day they're 14, the next they're 18. You're like, what <laughs> happened? It's like, what? Marty? <laughs> What's going on? Marty? <laughs> so, that, that's funny because there's a player on Snake named Martin. Oh! Uh, <laughs> the, the snake conspiracy. Snake <laughs> conspiracy. <laughs> In all seriousness, uh, like, as much as I don't understand Fondra and he's just kind of doing his own wacky stuff, like, I kind of love Snake this season for what they're yeah. doing like even it, even when they make no sense i don't know they're they're fun to watch except for like like in a really frustrating way too like that time they picked a uh, composition and proceeded to wait until late game and 5v5 team fight with it for no reason like i don't know they're they're it's interesting trying. and i think i i maintain what i said in the after the first week is that I appreciate that they were able to actually, like, identify a lot of weaknesses that they had from the previous split and are kind of carrying them into this split. So, I don't know. I, mm. I appreciate them a lot more this split. I'm actually right, currently writing an article about them. It's probably oh, like, we have an weird. actual mid laner that yes. we can do stuff with. <laughs> yeah. This is so deal. amazing. Definitely. What is I this? Think, the I think what's... possibilities okay. are literally endless. Oh my gosh. Unlimited. They don't have to lock they're, un un uh, uh, they're endlessly unlimited. Vichy Gaming and unlimited uh, potential. Okay. Uh, uh, but Mike's like, I want to make a fucking point. <laughs> <laughs> no, I oh, mean, yeah. Yeah. No, nothing too big. I just want to say that I think what Snake needs to do with Flandre is find like a happy medium because I wasn't really happy when he was like super confined to like playing a tank style with no resources after coming from the LSPL where he did do this crazy wacky shit. Uh, but also, you know, he needs to be. Able, they need to be a little bit more disciplined with him in the fact that he can't go completely overboard, but he should still kind of have his own flavor. So I think if they find like a good ha happy medium with with uh, with Flandre, they'll be good. But right now, he's just like goes super out of bounds with his builds and shit. And it needs to kind of be toned down. And I really liked like one of the early games that they played where they had the dual lane carry threat, right? Where they had Flandre play like Aurelia, and I think you played uh, LeBlanc. Maybe or mm -hmm. something like that, um, and then we had Crystal play Sivir. So uh, it's just they do they they actually are in a position. As much as I don't like, as much as I've been critical of Crystal, I should clarify. I should say, and he's he's shown that he has more dimensions, and they're in a position where they can actually run compositions based around any of their laners as threats and sometimes even beast the please like the nidalee has gotten excessive at yeah, this point yeah no um so they're trying to figure out what's work what works uh it's, it's just raining it in the other thing about snake though is that their drafting has never been that strong in general mm. so if they are willing to experiment with these compositions i think that they have to sit down and understand where the strengths and the weaknesses of these compositions lie before they execute them because they're going to need to compensate for that. Like, they're going to really need to understand how to draft them. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's an aspect that can be looked at. It's like, how are we going to draft these compositions we want to experiment with? So we don't end up in a situation where we don't have any wave clear and we don't have any team fight capability against like the quote-unquote RNG turtle comp, as Frostgren called it on the broadcast. So, <laughs> and they didn't have any siege potential either. It was just kind of a mess. It relies on positional threatening. <laughs> oh god! <laughs> positional threat, and they were but RNG wasn't splitting up because if you think about RNG, that team's not going to split up ever. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to run a pick comp against that? It's not going to work. So what's going on, like? Just on a larger scale of things, with with Team World Elite, obviously they have lovable Alu Aluka, King. They have a, a set too. They have Sky and Let Me, both of which they are. They also have played Ackerman for one game, so they oh, technically true. have three top laners. God damn it! Unlimited <laughs> potential. Unlike uh, some teams that don't even have actual top laners. Real top laners. <laughs> they just have, they don't. They have at you, masquerading top laners. <laughs> oh, hey, how are you doing, ADG? Um, In um, Insec. <laughs> Insec. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Is, he's, like the the he's like the worst out of all the pseudo top laners. The Jax buffs, yeah. though. Free cola, right? Ooh. 
Jack's free cups. cola. Free Ladies, cola. I, I can't believe cool. you said that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. I, can't. I love that. Uh, we give you too That's much right. freedom, much like laundry. <laughs> <That's> like... <laughs> On this show, uh, it's, too much. it's definitely a bad thing. <laughs> is cola is cola specifically not playing for performance, or is there like another reason that? And I don't there know are about? some rumors that cola didn't really want to play. Um, I also my because like insect is definitely not an upgrade, even over cola at his worst. I feel. My theory, I mean, I know it sounds harsh. I don't but... know. Insects had some good, good uh, Yasuo games. I just said that. Please stop me. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think uh, he's a perfect fit, man. The problem is that Insect and Zero have developed actually a really strong synergy. Like when they're working together, it looks really good. But the other issue is that Insect was not doing well in the jungle meta. Mm-hmm. As the jungle meta perhaps becomes more aggressive and he can play more Lee Sin games. Uh, maybe he'll be better in the jungle, but at the moment, like, I actually think top is a better position for him. So. Someone tweet at me, correct me, but wasn't Insect's last Korean game, uh, game in Korea, the, the worst Insect jungle game I've seen in my life? That's the real question. I'm wondering. I might be wrong, because I remember, I was probably the biggest well, one. I do remember I, before he, he... He left to like China, wasn't he considered like the worst jungler out of the entire like OGM yeah. league? Well, statistically, he was. Yeah, the worst. yeah that's because they. He fed his ass off in that one game, and for most of those games, but specifically that one, that was actually painful to watch. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can find vods of that and then put it out on Twitter. But and now <laughs> all of the junglers have followed him to China, and he cannot escape. Yeah. He He's like, I thought I was going to be good. The only way to escape is to transition to the top lane. But then they follow him there, too! And they follow yeah. him. <laughs> Dandy, why? He's like, I won't let Insect out me. I must the best be way to I track a jungler. He can't player. escape it. And he is. Dandy is literally counter-ganking like... Insect's career right now. <laughs> <laughs> He's counter-jungling his career. He's, He's literally there tracking him. We yeah. always talk about how Dandy is best known for his counter ganking style. Counter jungling. He's literally counter jungled insect his, his entire insect's career. Right now. I feel like Vici <laughs> took it too literally when, given, like when Dandy was given the advice that he should track uh, insect in the jungle, so he should be tracked <laughs> up to the top lane. <laughs> uh, okay, this joke has gone way too far. Uh, so I guess my question is now: Is there anything? else that you guys want to talk about. I feel like we pretty much tried to cross the land of LPL and Demacia Cup. We this... might want to hold on to LSPL. Demacia Cup this week I actually think will be really good, round of 16. Mm-hmm. Um, Chaogu versus LGD is coming up, a best Ooh. of five. That should be good. That's a really mm-hmm. exciting best of five. The, the cool thing about Demacia Cup is that if, it, if LGD wins, OMG wins, King wins and um, Snake wins, we technically have a complete replication of the playoffs bracket, with the mm. exception that King is actually not King. But, um, yeah, so that that's really interesting and it's really hyped up and I guess like the Beijing tickets have already completely sold out. They sold out within six hours. So the community is really excited, like for all three days, for the quarterfinals mm-hmm. through the finals. So the community is really excited about the possibility of seeing like the L- the LPL Spring playoffs recreated, um, but the round of 16 finishes this week, so we'll know for sure what our playoffs brackets, what our quarterfinals brackets in Beijing looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, I am excited for the LGD versus Chungu set, OMG versus Hyper Youth Gaming. Come on, let's go. Um, yeah. Yeah, a uh, King versus. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, unlimited potential. Hmm. I mean, we... Oh. Like, based, we... based on their LPL set, that should be one-sided, but we can't really base anything off of LPL sets. Yep. We know I'm for a fact enough. that that doesn't really work. Um, mm-hmm. And um, Snake versus Starhorn Royal Club, which, I don't know, the U versus Sask matchup appeals to me. I keep calling him a Sask. Yeah, it's I love Sask. JS, like, like, Assassin, yeah. Sask, yeah. all the same person. So, mm. And I actually really like their AD carry because they were using Wei for a while and I was just like, oh god, this team. Y4 is back and he's actually pretty good. Mm-hmm. 
So that is exciting. Um, okay. so my... All right. So anyone else? Uh, what are you guys looking forward to next week? And what did we not tread on for this week? Next week. For next week, we have Hyper Youth Gaming versus OMG, LGD versus Chagu, as she said, King versus UP. Well, actually, King versus UP and Snake versus Starhorn Road Club might. Oh, yeah, that'll happen. So she already said that. Huh. Yeah. I love repeating people. That's my. That's my Raz hobby. is kind of like Flandra. He's only half paying attention. Flandra's <laughs> <laughs> literally there. Flandra's been you. unleashed into, uh, into <laughs> Chinatown. Okay. The spirit of Flandra, it moves us mm. all. <laughs> Circle. No, okay, I'm done. Yeah, nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you cut that off quickly. Yeah. There we go. Uh, you all knew where I was going, so it's, it's yeah. fine. Nothing more so, to be said. LGD versus EDG mm -hmm. next week, too. Yeah, that yeah. Be yeah, that'd be nice. Everyone is excited for that. It'll either be nice or it'll just be a horrible thing to watch as. Uh, LGD confuses itself. So, <laughs> well, I feel kind of like LGD is refining their synergy now that PYL is yeah. back. Um, EDG is deteriorating. So, in that regard, it, it like that's what happened in the last playoffs, right? LGD was completely on point, and EDG was like they hadn't practiced all week because Pond was missing. So, it's yeah. like a recreation of the playoffs finals. There you go. This is exactly what we needed. So. Episodes, it's relative. I don't know. It's pretty. It's pretty nice, and I, I'd like to call this a nice hour and 20 thirty minutes. twenty minutes mm -hmm. episode. I like that idea. So let's go. Let's throw it off to uh, the good old. I wouldn't go. Oh yeah. Uh, what's it? I'm just gonna head off to Kelsey since you probably have. No 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 no. Shots. Okay. Need to reform. Need to need to reform my thoughts. I'm dying a little inside right now. This is the worst 10 seconds of my life. Emily, start <laughs> yes. with you. <laughs> shout outs. Um, shout, out. shout out to Emily Sports because I write for them and stuff. And also to Liquid Legends because I'm talking about Brazil this week on that site. So look for that if you're a Brazil fan. I don't know how many of you would be watching China Talk. But. Um, and then, like I said, I have an article on Snake that should be coming out either tonight or tomorrow. So, yay. Yay. Hey. And go read Kelsey's article on OMG. Cause she had an I'm going to hold out on that one. All right, Mike. Yeah, same. Just shout out to Esports Heaven and the lovely panelists here. And, yeah, that OMG article is pretty cool if you, like, are into the deeper infrastructural stuff. So. All right. All right, I guess it's not a secret now, Kelsey. I was trying to hold it off to the last point. I suck. <laughs> Kelsey, uh, so shut up. I think I'm going to say go ahead and watch uh, Ryan Lue's video on you, which mm. is actually really well edited. Like, it's funny in a lot of moments where... And um, that's... Rachel Youngu did the translations and the subtitles for that in English. Hopefully he will continue to set that up so that we can see more features like that about players. They're like really well polished, um, they're almost LOL Esports style player features. Now, also for me on the score, shout out to the score, they employ me. I did that recent OMG article. Um, thank you to Reasony who helped with the translation, Sharon Lee who facilitated the interview. Um, the CEO, who is really open to doing work and in interviews with me. Drexen, who will one day write an article, he said so on Twitter. Hey, I wrote one like yeah, a he month did. ago. <laughs> that, was, that was a good article. Oh, Thanks. Yeah. I'll try As to write me. another one this month. I'm going to toss you news. Congratulations to Razzleplasm, who has uh, not yeah, only yeah, become yeah, the yeah. new China Talk host, but he's also become the new Dignitas <laughs> EU analyst, and eventually he will replace Ross Proskurin on the LPL cast in Australia as well. So yeah. <laughs> He'll just do uh, all of those things. <laughs> He and is becoming Frostgren. Diggy U analyst and oh God, <laughs> no. the, the revolving door around the world. Everybody, wave your hands as we end this show. Hands, like both of them. Both, both of them. It's gonna okay. make it hard. For I don't know how we're gonna turn off. The